want you to notice here. This is the first man in space. Notice the diffused light on the helmet and notice the oval helmet. Okay? Now, this is the lone man in space, but in the first spacewalk. Notice again the diffused light on the helmet. Another view of the same man. Notice the light of our astronaut in space of a single, the spark of light, you know? Because there's no atmosphere to diffuse light and no hydrosphere, light will only come as a star burst, never diffused. To be diffused on a curved surface, you must be in hydrosphere or atmosphere. You cannot be in a vacuum. If anybody doesn't understand that, well, just pop up. Here's the walk, first walk, space walk, and here's this man coming out going on the first space walk. Who's in space taking his picture? Tell me where the cameraman jumped out there. Now we have the same space walk, but this is a TV film. But as you will see, he now has changed helmet in space, which is very nice because he had an oval helmet in the movie film, but he's got a square lens in the TV film. Now that has got to be a trick of tricks to change his helmet in space. Again, we're back at the... Uh, notice the background. There is none. We have this odd line around him. Now in space, because there is no atmosphere or hydrosphere, you either have white or black. You don't have the diffusion of grays, and in the creases are all black, if you look at the American one. This line here, the Air Force Intelligence and Kodak blew this up and he said, this picture was made by three pictures separated by glass. And that's what causes this line around here. They took a frame by frame, took a film of this guy, with a blue background with infrared film. And then they took a background, which they have in this very fuzzy background, and put that back there, and they were showing how they, uh, they make these triple exposures and able to uh, superimpose one the other. This is the only problem, it's a very sloppy piece of work. Notice here the US astronaut. Here he's out there. Notice his cords coil all up in space. The others isn't, it's drooping, it's still in gravity. All right? The Russian. Notice the black and the white. You see? The complete contrast. Notice the background. Here we have a big uh, movie film with this astronaut in space, and we can see the hook and the cable that he's hanging from. The uh, Air Force drew in the line of the cable a little better for you to see it. A blue cable with a blue background taken with infrared film. Here the Russians put in for the world speed aeronautical record, and they're given the certificate of their stopwatch, which was used for timing the space flight. With the stopwatch. Here's the picture the Russians sent us of their miniature circuitry for their missile. This at the same time as ours on the same scale circuitry of the same circuits done by Westinghouse at the same time. There's one thing, if that's the circuitry, they never got off the ground. There's no amount of propulsion that will drive up that kind of equipment. Here's the picture the Russians sent us of their command space headquarters for the spacewalk. <laughs> if that hadn't got in backwards, it would be even a little better, but if all of you stand on your head, you'll get that. These are the only places that the Sputnik movement of the beep beep was tracked. It was not a movement, it was tracked. The, the, the beep beep was picked up in other places in the world, but there was no apparent motion to it. But this is Sputnik 1. Oh, oh that picture is never going to come in. That, anyway, what does it take to do that? Three trawlers in the Atlantic Ocean with directional antenna and about $400 worth of equipment out of Radio Shack will give you a motion beep, 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 beep. And that's all they ever had. And I say, here's, here is cosmonaut Titov. Inspects the Mercury capital during his visit to the U.S. after his uh, claiming flight of 17 orbits. Titov never once mentioned the firefly effect. Do you know why? We hadn't been up there yet to see it. <laughs> and he never saw it. In his report of the flight uh, of the, in the dossier submitted to the FAI, uh, but after astronaut Glenn had made his flight report the of the phenomenon, Tita said he also saw it. 
Yet here he's in a flight and he's to record everything. There's not much really going on. And he doesn't see the firefly effect, the most spectacular effect of all, and doesn't make a mention of it. Well, anyway, my point is this. Uh, let's go back here for one for a second and let me finish up. Russia as a military power simply does not exist. They have kings because we give it to them. We gave them an atomic bomb in 1948, complete from trigger, right out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. We seeing finally said what I said, so that makes it true, obviously, right? Uh, if Life magazine did it, who could question that? Uh, something's wrong here. There we go. I'm trying to bring it. I got one of these zoom lenses, and I haven't figured out how to run it yet. There it is. Well, anyway, Life Magazine, after Welch running me over, I'll put a whole article. There's a book written on it. The article is from the book. Just to show you how conspiracy works a little bit. Uh, here is the U-boat, uh, the U-20, that sunk the, uh, the Lusitania. The Lusitania, you were told, or the American people were told, was an innocent passenger ship on the high seas that was attacked savagely by a submarine. Uh, and, of course, the submarines violated international law because the law said that a ship which sunk another ship had to be had to take upon the survivors that other ship upon itself. And, obviously, the U-20 could not take on the passengers of the Lusitania. Right? So this was considered a very barbarous act of war. Now, let me give you just a few conditions. These are things in the article, by the way. These things I have been saying, but the Life magazine collaborated it, so we know it's true. One, the Lusitania was not an innocent passenger ship. The Lusitania was built by the Admiralty as a cruiser of the British line. Now, all of the, most of the ships, England ships, were made by Admiralty under government contracts. Well, as military ships, even though they tour, uh, uh, were passenger vessels, they had all of their armament positions built into them. Just like after the Second World War, a lot of our airliners were built with Bombay positions <laughs> built into them. Uh, they could be converted. I don't know whether they're still doing that or not, but for quite a while we did that. Anyway, the Lusitania, on the day the war started, sailed into dry dock to receive her armaments. And she was commissioned on that day as a cruiser of the line of the Royal Navy. She was not an innocent passenger ship. She was a cruiser of the line, commissioned in military service, armed with the armaments of a light cruiser. Now, the next thing about the Lusitania. She went into New York Harbor with a new captain for this trip. This was then the largest vessel of the world. Went into New York Harbor, and where she took upon herself more armaments and munitions than any ship of the world in the history of the world to that date had ever carried. Under the guise of being a green load, one of the reasons she sunk so badly was the fact it was not the torpedo that sunk her. It was the things the torpedo hid inside of her. A torpedo could not put down the Lusitania. She went down in minutes. With holes all through her. The British Admiralty were in question. Where are all these holes come from in this thing? It's supposed to be laden with grain. Anyway, <clears throat> the Lusitania was sailing up the to, to come up the channel. And when they were coming up the channel, there was three different routes for her to be given. A signal off of uh, uh, West End there of what route to take. The night before the Lusitania came up the channel... They had sighted the U-20 where she laid. In those days, those submarines could move very fast. They knew where she was going to be in the morning. The Lusitania was ordered to sail up past the U-20. Now, the next thing is that the cruiser Juno was the, uh, the protecting ship for coming up the channel. That is, the Juno was to come out and meet the Lusitania and give her a screen as she came up. The Juno that morning was called back by the Lord of the Admiralty into her port at Queenston. Sir Winston Churchill. All right? So the Lusitania, now sailing up there, <clears throat> and watch something else about the Lusitania. The American passengers, and there weren't very many aboard the ship, the German government had taken ads in American newspapers and even had their agents stationed on the gangplank of the Lusitania to warn every American citizen that this ship was a ship of a nation at war. And they were going upon a belligerent ship, a warship of the line. 
And under the law, the England had, the Germany had the right for belligerent action against her, and that the German government could not be held responsible for what would happen to an American citizen sailing under the British flag of a ship of the line. The German government guaranteed safe passage of all Americans to England on American flag ships, but would not guarantee and could not give them safe passage on the ships of a warship. These people, for whatever reason, want to bomb that ship. Now, once you go and have the, the Lusitania sunk, we have the nice bodies carried in the weeping and demand for war. You see, England at this time wanted the United States entry, and our government pressed for it. Wilson went for it. Now, Wilson's alter ego, the real president of the United States, was a man named the, or called the mysterious E. Mandel House. A very mysterious kind of fellow. But anyway, House was like Kissinger before he became Secretary of State. He went around the world making all the deals for us without any authority, apparently, whatsoever, except some authority, because he obviously represented some group that did mean something. E. Mandel House was walking with the Vice Lord of the Admiralty on the morning the Lusitania was coming up the channel, and the Vice Lord of the Admiralty said to E. Mandel House, Mr. House, what would happen if the Lusitania sunk? And House is reported to have applied, I'm sure war can be arranged. Churchill left for France. He didn't want to be around <clears throat> because he was Lord of the Admiralty, and obviously he was responsible, so he dug out. And the torpedo slammed in. And they went for a war, but our Congress at that time was still not into this conspiracy deep enough. They wouldn't go. They refused. Now, what Wilson now gets elected in 1917, he takes office for a second term. And what was his campaign? He kept us out of war. And what did he do 30 days after he kept us out of war? He went for a declaration of war, and we were at war. Nothing can lie like a politician, can it? Hmm?